This video is sponsored by the design mechanism, the makers of Mithras. Mithras is a registered trademark of the Design Mechanism Inc. used with permission, all rights reserved. So in this video, we are going to be looking at how to create characters in the game of Mithras. My name's Inrose and welcome to the InCrowd. And if you enjoy this video or any of my videos, then please consider subscribing to the channel. And you can do this and you will get notifications when my videos go live and you will be supporting not only this channel, but also my dream. So in these videos, we've covered various aspects of the game of Mithras. And now you probably have enough information to start your first character. As with everything else in the Mithras rule set, there are very many options within character generation. And I will try to detail as many of them as I can within this video. I'll also mention how we create characters within our own um, Odes campaign. Now, initially, everyone has to start off with some kind of character concept. And I will be assuming that you've already done this and you've got some ideas in your head. Remember, it's always best to consult with your game master in order to uh, ensure that your character fits well into the existing campaign. Don't worry, if you haven't got a character concept already, then you can still watch this video and I will be um, producing another video on how to create a character concept at a later date. But now it's time to grab those dice because we are about to start a character. So first up, let's talk about characteristics. Now, these are the basic stats which every character has, and it tells you how strong, clever, fast, healthy your character is. Now, the characteristics are as follows. Strength, how strong. Constitution, how healthy. Size, what is your size, height and weight. Dexterity, how nimble and quick you are. Intelligence, how clever you are power, those hidden reserves of magical energy, and finally, charisma, how persuasive you are. Now, although you can have other races within the game of Mithras, in this video, we are going to stick with humans, since that is what I use in my Odes campaign. All the characters are human. It makes it very good when they're going underground and all have to grab those torches or lanterns. So, there are three different ways to calculate the scores for your characteristics. If a random score is needed, then you would roll 3d6s um, for your strength, constitution, dex, power and charisma, which would generate a number between a minimum of 3 and a maximum of 18. For intelligence and size, you roll a 2d6 add 1, with the minimum again being 3, but the maximum this time being 13. Now, there's two different ways you can use these scores. You can either roll them and whatever you roll becomes that characteristic. So my first roll, 3d6s would become my strength, etc. Or you can roll all the dice and then assign them to the characteristic that you wish. Now remember the 2d6 plus 1 can only go to intelligence or size. Now there is a third method that you can use and that is what we favour in our ODES campaign. You are allocated 75 points to be assigned to your characteristics however you seem fit. Now you have to ensure that the minimum characteristic is always on the characters. So for example with strength you can't go lower than three. Um, but you can also only add um, points to take the characteristic to the highest, um, the maximum um, number of points. So for example, again with strength, you can't go high, any higher than 18. Now we personally feel this allows much more of a um, more control over the character generation. But as mentioned, you can use whichever method you wish. 
Now, once you've got your characteristics, you use these to determine your attributes. And it's really important now that you understand the difference here because a lot of um, games or rule sets use those terms interchangeably. But remember, your characteristics are your strength, intelligence, etc. And your attributes are your scores or abilities which are derived from your characteristics. Now, there are a range of um, attributes and I'm going to quickly talk about them now. So first up, action points. These are the number of actions that you have per round, um, which we talked a lot about when we talked about combat. Damage modifier, which gives you an extra dice when you are hitting things in combat. Experience modifier, so this allows you to add or subtract rolls from the number of experience rolls that are given to you at the end of an adventure. Healing rate, how quickly you will heal up naturally. Your height and weight, self-explanatory. Hit points, the number of hit points in each location. So go and watch the combat video if you're not too sure about what that means. Your initiative bonus, the um, bonus that you add to rolling when you roll a 1d10, ready for initiative. Luck points, the number of points that you can you have per session, per playing session, that you can either use to reverse the dice score on a roll or choose to roll it again. Magic points, you what you use to fuel your spells, and finally your movement rate. Now, each one of those attributes are uh, depends on one or more of the other initial characteristics that you rolled. For example, action points are calculated by adding your intelligence and your dexterity together and then consulting a table. Now, if you go to page eight of the core rule book, there's all the tables there that explains each of the attributes and what they actually do. Now, one thing I would really like to say at this point is that the system is very well balanced. OK, so don't go around thinking this won't work and start to change things. For example, Hengis, the tanky character in our campaign, has a very nice damage modifier, but lacks points in charisma. So only has to have one less experience roll than everyone else because he has an experience roll modifier of minus one. So at the end of a series of adventures, I might give the characters three experience rolls. He automatically loses one due to his low charisma and ends up only getting two. On the other hand, Gulliver has a high amount of magic points because he's a sorcerer, he casts spells. So he has a high power, which gives him those magic points. However, don't ask him to hit something because he has a negative damage modifier. Now, also remember that your basic skill role is determined by your um, characteristics. For example, combat styles, your base combat style is calculated by adding your strength and dexterity together. Well, folk magic, that's professional skill, is calculated by adding your power and charisma together. Now, you can find out more information about these skills by watching the skill video that I've also made. OK, then. So talking about skills, how are these determined within character generation? So in order to determine what skills your character has, you have two decisions to make. First, which culture did your character originate from? And secondly, what was their career? Now, at this point, I have to make it quite clear that all of the standard skills everybody gets as default. However, during character generation, you can add points to certain standard skills. However, professional skills are only available through character generation, and that's it. So let's talk about culture. So there are four options for you within the rule book when to choose your culture. These are barbarian, civilized, primitive and nomadic. Now, each of these cultures have different skills which your character can invest points within. For example, a civilized culture has the following standard skills that it can invest in. Conceal, um, deceit, drive, as in a wagon, not as in a car, influence, 
insight, locale, which is a skill that allows you to determine general knowledge about the area, and willpower. They have various combat styles, such as citizen legionnaire or city um, city state guard or archers or street thugs or town militia. Now, you can make up your own combat styles, but make sure that you talk to your um, game master about that. They also, in the civilized culture, has some professional skills. Art, any. Now, when it says any in brackets, it means that you have to specify what that art skill is in. The same with craft. So it might be craft woodwork, craft metalwork, something like that. Commerce, buying and selling. Courtesy, of course, my lord. Languages, law and against. This has to be specified. So is it law monsters like Mr. Bartleby has? Musicianship, and streetwise. Now, if you were from a barbarian culture, then you have different skills. So your standard skills include endurance. That's how um, robust you are um, within combat. You can survive longer without having to make fatigue rolls. First aid, locale, perception, stealth, and then two of the following, either athletics, boating, swimming, driving a wagon, or ride. Your combat styles are related to your tribe. So, for example, you could have one that says camel cavalry or fe feathered death flinger. It's up to you, but normally um, you can talk to your game master about that, this. And barbarians professional skills include craft, any, culture, normally to do with your barbarian culture, language and law, musicianship, navigate, how to get from place to A to B, survival, how good you are, survival out in the open, and track. Now, all cultures also have suggested passions as well. Now, we talked about this in the skill video. If you wish to include these at character generation in conversation with your game master, then this is possible. However, in our own campaign, I tend to develop these as players role play their characters and the passions come to the forefront. Now, the other thing that I will say at this point is that it's really important that you look at the cultures in relation to your character concept. If you've got a final idea about what your character is going to look like, then it's important to go with a culture that not only reflects your character concept, but also provides the necessary skills. There's a lot of discussion here um, about which culture, and also some game masters might not have all the cultures cultures within their campaigns. So once you have decided your culture, you can start assigning some skill points. Now, you apply a static bonus to customs and native tongue. Okay, these are 40% to each irrespective of the culture chosen. Now, these would be related to your tribe or where you live and should be sort of like developed by you as your character to sort of like um, invest more of a background. Native tongue, of course, is just talking. If you want to re learn to read and write, then that's a literacy, literacy role. Okay, you can then select three of the professional skills from the options offered. And if desired, select a single combat skill. Okay, so three professional skills of the one that are, are given and one combat skill. Okay, then you distribute 100 points amongst the listed standard skills, the chosen professional skill and combat skill if selected, increasing those skills by 1% for every point spent on it. Okay, you can choose how much each skill um, gets or is improved by, but it must receive a minimum of 5% and cannot receive more than 15%. Okay, so the, go back and listen to that again. But basically, there is some time now to start adding skill points. But don't forget that um, customs and na native tongue automatically get plus 40%. So once you've 
allocated and assigned your cultural skill points, it's time to choose your career. Now, your choice of career is limited by your culture. So again, this might be something you want to check um, beforehand to make sure that you've actually got your career in your culture. Now, some um, game masters might just say, no, you can go with anyone. There is an example um, on page 26 of the core rule book to have a look at. But again, consult with your game master. So it's really important that you pick um, a career, that a culture and career together. So for example, if you're a civilized culture, if you're from a civilized culture, then you almost all careers are available for you. However, there are less available for say, for example, the nomadic culture. So do have a look and think about the whole process of character generation before you sort of start investing points. Now, there's something else to remember at this point. Remember that magic skills are only available in certain careers. So choose wisely. And this is really... Um, relates to all the professional skills. Um, within your career, you will be able to assign skill points to standard skills and professional. So if you want a particular professional skill, then make sure you inc go for a career that has that skill in. So to give you an example of this, let's think of the career of the agent. Now, these are either assassins or spies or things like that. Their standard skills that you're going to be able to invest points in are conceal, deceit, evade, insight, perception, stealth, and a combat style called concealable, concealable, concealable weapons. Also in their professional skills, there's culture, disguise, language, a sleight of hand, um, streetwise, and survival and track. Well, a priest um, career, they have their standard skills of custom, dance, deceit, influence, insight, locale, and willpower. And their professional skills are bureaucracy, devotion, which is really important for their um, intensity of their spells, exhort, which is their spell casting skill, folk magic, literacy, law, and oratory. So you can see that each skill is different and there's a huge list of these within the core rulebook. So go and have a look at them and decide which would be best for your character um, concept. Now, once you've decided about your career, you can then assign skill points using the following points. Okay then, so you can select up to three skills from the professional skills available for each career. Now you have to then distribute 100 points amongst the career's listed standard skill and whatever professional skills you've chosen. And you can increase in each skill by 1% for every point spent on it. Now, not all the skills need to be improved, but no individual skill can receive more than 15%. Now, we actually made a mess of this in um, character generation. So read those again. It does say distribute 100 points amongst the characters listed standard skills. So it has to include all of them. We didn't, but the characters didn't, um, weren't penalized or benefited in any way because of that. Okay. At this point, I have to say that there are other options available in character generation, um, which uh, include things like background roles, passions, effects of age. But in order to keep this um, video short and to the point, I'll talk about those in another video all about the additional um, options for character generation. Okay then, we're nearly there, so hang on in there. Um, the next thing that we need to do in order to finish your character is assign the bonus skill points. Okay, so a default adult character um, has a pool of 150 points with a limit of assigning those skill points with no more than 15 points per skill. Okay, now this is when age comes into it. And there's a table in Mithras that allows you to make your character younger or older. Obviously, the older you are, the more bonus skill points you will get. But I'll talk about that in a different video. Okay then, so bonus skill points are used in the following way. The character is allowed to choose one final 
new combat style or professional skill to reflect their personal hobby or interest okay then so it could be either or but within careers okay then so for example in our campaign the odis campaign i wouldn't allow um the agent to suddenly um grab folk magic now you might want to allow this and this is a totally up to you i'm not too clear on the rules whether or not they can or they cannot but it would be up to you and your game master now you've got these 150 points and you can distribute them amongst whatever skills the character currently has increasing each skill by one percent for each point no individual skill can receive more than the points indicated by their age category. Now, remember for an adult, that is 15 points, but that changes depending um, how old they are. So if they're young, it goes down to 10 points. If they're older, then you can assign more. There is the option of a hobby skill and you can have a hobby skill that you can increase that one selected skill of interest can increase as much as you want but no points may be assigned to those combat skills or professional skills not learned as part of their culture or career so you can't suddenly grab a new one and then use it you have to focus on those skills that you've actually already got now don't worry, I know there's been a whole lot of skill points and rules, etc., but we're nearly there, and pretty soon you'll be heading out of the local town to tackle those monsters. So finally, your character is going to need some equipment and cash, and these are determined by the social class of your character within their respective culture. Now, you can find a list of these on page 24 of the core rulebook, but a lot of the time, if you've got a good or an existing character concept, you can talk to your game master and they will discuss this um, with you to choose the best one for you if you want to go completely random then there is a table and you can roll a d100 and get what you're given now just to give you some example of this um, each of the cultures starts with a set amount of money for example barbarians start with 46 times 50 um, silver pieces However, each of the social classes has a modifier to this amount. So, for example, if you are a barbarian, you would roll 46s times 50 for your silver pieces. However, if you are a ruling barbarian, high up on the social class, then you get a modifier of times 5 to that money. However, if you are a slave, then you get a modifier of times 0.5. So you will end up with a lot less money. Also, within your social class, you can have various um, items. For example, uh, a free man um, to do with um, any um, sort of like class will have two sets of common undecorated clothes suitable to the free man's occupation. You'll also have 1D2 simple weapons suited to your culture. For example, axe clubs, knives, spears, slings, and the likes of that. Okay, then, and you roll 1d3, and this represents the armor points for the armor the character has. And armor is available in 1d6 locations. It also allows you to have some kind of transport, um, whether or not that's a raft, handcart, or a beast of burden. So you can see that the social class uh, from the background gives you a whole load of new um, information. And that's it. Your character is good to go, save for giving it a name and, of course, an appropriate voice. So as I mentioned earlier on, there's a whole load of options to do with passions and age, etc. that I'll look at in another video. But if you want a nice step-by-step -step guide um, for your character generation, then within the core rule book on page 36, there's a nice guide there for you. So as well as this video, go and check that out. Now, as always, if you have any other questions, then please do add them in the comments below and I will try to answer them.
So if you have enjoyed this video, then please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing. Yes, every sub takes me one closer, one step closer to my dream and supports the channel no end. So until next time, I would just like to say to each and every one of you, please remember to be who you are and say what you think because the people who mind don't matter and the people who matter don't mind. Have fun and I'll catch you all later. And until then, happy character generation. See you later, guys. Bye.